So today um, we have uh, Tatania uh, Joseph, who is a PhD student at the Computer Laboratories of University of Cambridge under the supervision of Paul Petrolios. His research explores the intersections of geometric deep learning and GNN for the modeling molecules, proteins, and biochemical systems. Previously, he was a research engineer at ASTAS, I square out, and he was awarded the National Science uh, Scholarships NSS PhD Scholarships. Part of that, uh, he graduated as a um, from NTU, okay, in computer science in 2019. So today she is giving us a very inspiring talk on this, on the expressive power of geometric graph neural network. So uh, thanks, speakers. Please uh, join me together uh, with no further delay for his talk. Great. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, this is joint work with my co-authors, uh, Christian Bodnar, Simon Mathis, Taco Cohen, and my supervisor, Pietro Leo. Uh, and the paper is on archive as well as the code is available. Uh, so this work is about uh, modeling systems with geometry and relational structure. Such systems can be found across biochemistry, but also in engineering. Um, so we've just listed down some of these systems. And essentially, geometric graph neural networks have become a fundamental tool for machine learning on these geometric graph type systems. Uh, so if you're given a geometric graph and you want to make some prediction about its properties, uh, geometric GNNs have really emerged as, as the state-of-the-art technique to do so. And in this example, for, uh, for instance, you might want to predict something about a protein and a ligand, a small molecule binding to each other. Uh, this is a common setup in um, lots of drug discovery applications. Um, similarly, uh, you might want to generate new geometric graphs. Uh, and recently, there's been lots of exciting progress in protein design uh, here, where you're, you're given in input geometric graphs as proteins, and you might want to then learn how to sample uh, new proteins with desired properties, desired structures. And finally, another broad and exciting application area is dynamic simulation. So geometric graph neural networks are emerging as a, as a proxy for um, quantum mechanics for DFT type um, approaches for molecular dynamics as well. And there's been some exciting progress in, in uh, this direction too. And as I said, the core machine learning tool for all of this are geometric graph neural networks. Now, geometric GNNs, well, there's been a lot of work in this area, and I'm going to briefly go through it. Um, broadly, we, we, we tried to categorize this work based on the intermediate features used within these models. I'll make all that clear later, but I'm just providing a bit of an executive summary at the start. Um, and this, this work really, uh, we focused on a, a type of approach that is reference free, um, and we'll discuss certain examples, but at the start, it's worth noting that there's also geometric genomes that are based on local reference frames, um, and things like alpha fold, for example, would come on in the, in this, uh, category on the left side, but our work is focused on the reference free approaches, which, which are more general and, um, do not require, let's say some domain specific, uh, knowledge. So, um, just as an executive summary of this work, before we actually dive in, um, our key takeaway and learning was a deeper understanding of the design space of geometric GNNs. And we, we were able to think about geometric GNNs in terms of three broad axes. Um, and we've listed those down in the slides. Um, so the, the, the ideas are of body order of a layer, tensor order of the features used inside the layer, and the amount of layers you stack or depth. 
And in terms of these three axes, we can try to understand and explain a lot of current architectures, and that helps us um, find the limitations and potentially build new ones. Uh, so just to quickly go through them, what we found um, for those who are already aware of these models is that invariant layers are limited in terms of expressivity and they cannot distinguish certain one hop identical graphs. Uh, whereas equivariant layers are more powerful and they do this via propagating local geometry beyond local neighborhoods. And finally, we, we also demonstrated the utility of why we need uh, certain higher order tensors and scalarization for building the most powerful models, which is something that the community has been um, interested to investigate. Now to, to give a bit of background on all this and to contextualize all these findings, um, I'll talk a bit about graph neural networks and geometric graphs. So very briefly, a normal graph is a set of nodes connected by edges. Uh, and generally, right, what you have with each node is a set of scalar features, scalar in the sense of, of physics, really. So you'd have a list of numbers associated with each node. And an example of this could be the atom type, whether a node is a carbon atom or a nitrogen atom and so on. And graph neural networks essentially learn to update each node's features by learning how to borrow features from your neighbors by a local aggregation process. And this is called message passing because each node uh, constructs a message um, over edges. And then the central node, which uh, would aggregate messages from all its neighbors, these are some equations. And the important thing to note with message passing is that you're essentially building a computation tree. You, every layer of message passing is gathering features from, from um, larger and larger neighborhoods or nodes which are further and further away. And as a result, you also propagate your own features uh, further and further away. So that's a brief primer on normal GNNs. What, uh, when we move to the geometric graph setting, right? The important thing is that now each of our nodes is not just associated with some scalar quantities, but is also embedded in Euclidean space. So in a molecule, your atoms would be embedded in 3D space. Um, this is always true, right? Like all these systems in science are, are embedded in the 3D world around us. And importantly, you also have certain geometric quantities associated with your nodes. So there's a distinction now between the scalar features in blue, which are things like the atom type, and these geometric quantities, these vector type features. Um, and again, vector in the in the sense of physics. So as, as the picture shows, you know, you can imagine an arrow be, uh, uh, in three dimensions being a feature. And and this is what makes geometric graphs exciting because now your geometric attributes actually transform with certain Euclidean transformations of the system, um, which is to say that geometric graphs have additional symmetries. So uh, one of the Euclidean symmetries, the most important one is that of rotations and reflections. Uh, so if you were to take your geometric graph and rotate it, your your coordinates and your geometric features will actually rotate along with how your system rotates, whereas your scalar features do remain unchanged. So if you rotate a molecule, your atom types don't change, right? But their positions do change. Another geometric or Euclidean transformation is that of translations. So you could move your graph in space. Uh, and importantly, translations only act on the coordinates, but the vector type quantities are, um, are not affected by it. Uh, so they remain invariant as well. And just the presence of these symmetries, these needing to ref respect these transformations um, leads to normal GNNs not being applicable for geometric graphs. We, we essentially need new tools because normal graph neural networks don't have the right physics baked into them. And we need to incorporate these physical symmetries into our GNNs. 
And that gives rise to two building blocks of geometric GNNs. So the first one are scalar functions or invariant functions for scalar features, I should say. So as we said, like when you rotate your geometric graph, your, your scalar features do not change, right? So if you were designing a layer to update scalar features, then you'd need to, um, you'd need to respect this physical symmetry, this, this semantic essentially of scalar features. And so you'd like to map rotated versions of the geometric graph to the same scalar features. On the other hand, you also have these vector features, right? So if you want to update your vector features for each node, you now need to do something more special. You need to build equivariant functions, which essentially mean that if you take your input and you rotate it, and then apply your geometric GNN layer or function, then the output should be the same as if you were to apply the layer and then rotate the output. Uh, essentially, your, your input and output of an equivariant function should, um, should, should respect the transformation semantics of uh, these vector type features and should rotate under rotations of your system. And these two functions are essentially the building blocks. And we'll discuss how, how some of these are instantiated and give a few uh, concrete examples of this. And before we do that, though, uh, just to briefly give this general geometric GNN message passing framework is that um, you now update both scalars as well as vector features optionally. So remember that previously we only had, let's say this one arrow carrying scalar features from your neighbors to your central node and you aggregated things there. Well, now you'd also have a geometric message or a vector type uh, message and that those quantities are denoted by this uh, arrow on, on top. And importantly, uh, your aggregate and update functions must respect those physical symmetries that we, we just spent some time discussing. And we'll now give some concrete examples just, just, to, just to drill home this point and just to introduce, introduce people to some real uh, architectures that, that we'll later be studying. So um, essentially, we, we'll discuss the design space of geometric GNNs and Concretely, the design space is uh, body order, invariance versus equivariance, as well as tensor order. We'll make all these things clear. So the first and simplest set of geometric GNNs are called invariant GNNs, rotation invariant GNNs. And these models, unlike what the previous slide said, only update the scalar features via converting local geometric information into invariant quantities. And what that, uh, what that actually entails um, is that, uh, what do I mean by scalarization? Well, I mean, taking some geometric information and converting it into a scalar. Concretely, distances are the best example of this, right? So um, the simplest geometric GNN model, all it does is when it constructs the message from your neighbor, it additionally concatenates the pairwise um, distance in Euclidean space along with that message. And this approach has been very successful and has been used across many applications. Uh, and this sort of approach is invariant. Uh, these are rotation invariant GNNs, right? So using the pairwise distance to construct the messages invariant because the pairwise distance is a quantity that that is, is invariant under rotations and translations itself. So you could take a graph and you could rotate it, you could move it around in space, but all the distances among nodes would never change. And, and that's why the overall model, which only uses um, distances as geometric information is, is going to remain uh, invariant. So this is the equation of the Schnett model. Um, but the key idea is to just add the distances as, uh, as features. 
DimeNet is is a sort of upgrade on the Schnet model. So you know you could think about well, what else remains invariant under global rotations? Uh, a great example is angles, right? So distances remain the same, but so do angles. And this is what DimeNet does. DimeNet now starts building message passing among triplets and considers angles among um, all pairs of neighbors. And this, this is a good, good way to understand this concept of body order of scalarization. So Chenette, which used distances, has body order two because two bodies are used to compute a distance. Um, at the same time, DimeNet involves three bodies because you always need three to construct an angle. And you could imagine generalizing this further. So if you wanted maybe more powerful geometric features, we'll define power later. But if you wanted more powerful geometric features, you could, you could imagine going up to four body and five body and so on. Uh, so this, this is how invariant GNN sort of can be improved. But of course, there's a computational challenge as well. So here's the equation of DimeNet. But what you might immediately notice is that there are two for loops uh, in, in this case. So you need to loop over your neighborhood twice, which, which obviously is not the most computationally uh, efficient thing to do. So this was one class of models. The, the other class of models that we'll be studying are uh, equivariant graph neural networks in the Cartesian uh, basis. And these are the models that now, uh, instead of just uh, using invariants, they also propagate geometric messages, as we were talking about. They also propagate vector type messages. So they have the sort of two um, arrows going in. And, and really the key idea is to, how do you move from invariant to equivariant message passing? So uh, a good example is this model called Bain, which as we said, updates both scalar and vector type features. So it has two types of messages. The scalar message is essentially the same as Schnett. It just uses the pairwise distance. The vector message is, is some sort of gating of, the, of this filter, let's say, with your neighbor's vector features, as well as with your uh, displacement vector. So you have two types of information and you, you just want to use all the information you have. Um, the, the important thing to note with equivariant GNNs though is, um, and one of the criticisms of equivariant GNNs also is that you're restricted to very few operations in order to ensure equivariance, uh, which is why you need to do this sort of gating, um, of your vector features. You can't directly apply something like a ReLU on your vector features. Um, you're limited to very few operations like sums, dot products, and uh, cross products. And the reason really is that you need to respect those physical uh, symmetries. You need to respect the transformation behaviors of vector type features. And, and so, so, that pain is a very, very good example of, of these vector type uh, GNNs. Uh, the third class of models are equivariant GNNs using a different basis. So basis essentially means like, uh, at least in physics, like how we are representing geometric quantities. And generally, you know, we're more used to the Cartesian basis, like X, Y, Z coordinates, but another choice of basis often is this spherical basis where you have a radius and two angles. So you represent things as points on a sphere. And so people have built geometric GNNs from that perspective as well. Uh, the advantage of this spherical basis is that it, it very easily allows you to study higher order tensors. Um, I'm going to talk very briefly about this, but if there are questions, then I'm happy to go in more details. I think this class of architectures is really um, nice for physicists because there's a lot of math that 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 we are borrowing from from physics and from uh, from molecular modeling. So very briefly, right? Every node is associated to a higher order spherical tensor, and this is connected to what we just talked about because order zero and one in higher order tensors correspond to scalars and vectors. Um, 
And these features will be updated by a Tensor product with your neighborhood of your neighbor's features. So you, you borrow your neighbor's features, right? So you need to uh, take a Tensor product of this with, um, with the spherical harmonic expansion of your displacement vector. So spherical harmonic expansion is a way to construct um, tensors out of displacement vectors. So you take tensor product of two tensors on your edge and you aggregate that. Um, and spherical harmonic is, is essentially, you know, you, you take a vector and it, it, it's a way to, to convert it into a tensor where I'm going very briefly here. And that's what gives you this tensor field network framework. The, the key thing about tensor field networks is essentially that you have higher order tensors. And that, that's a good bridge into our motivation. How powerful are these models? And essentially, how do all these design choices like higher order tensors, body order scalarization, invariance, how do they um, impact expressive power? What are their theoretical limitations? And uh, finally, you know, what's the practical implication of those uh, limits? So I'll pause at this point and then I, I just want to check if there are any questions um, because I I think it's it's a good point to sort of uh, discuss. Um, thanks for the thanks for the great questions. So I'm I'm gonna move into the next part now. So we, we discussed all this stuff, right? Like the design space of these geometric GNNs and we have these three um, classes of models. And, you know, essentially we want to understand why people do these things and really get a deeper understanding of our tools before we apply them to molecules, to proteins and to all these exciting application areas. So, so um, before we make it concrete, right? Here's a little game we can play. Can you tell these two local neighborhoods apart using the unordered set of distances and angles here? So these are two different geometric structures, right? But um, can can you actually tell them apart using um, using just distances and angles as some of the models actually do? Um, and it turns out that you cannot because all the pairwise distances are the same and all all the angles or the set of angles are the same. If you don't have an ordering, which GNNs don't, you can't actually tell them apart. So this, this little sort of, th this idea of telling neighborhoods apart using geometric quantities is now very relevant for geometric GNNs, especially like to think about a single layer of geometric GNNs. So then, you know, this, this, we can move from discriminating local neighborhoods to discriminating entire graphs. So what if all local neighborhoods have the same invariant scalars as they do in this case, right? So all the angles among all local neighborhoods are the same and all the distances are the same as well. How do you actually tell, tell these graphs apart? Well, you, you actually cannot tell them apart using only scalars unless you constructed scalars that were um, long range maybe, but you know, using the scalars that are local, using local neighborhoods, you actually cannot tell these two graphs apart. And, and the way to actually tell them apart is to think about how these local neighborhoods are oriented with respect to each other not just about the scalars like distances and angles, but to really think about certain geometric or directional information involved here. And we can see that, you know, the orientation of the two neighborhoods, the two neighborhoods are the same up to rotation, right? Like you can rotate them and they'd be the same neighborhood, but they're actually oriented differently in space. Uh, so then, this leads us to our central idea, and we, we really want to formalize this problem that we just talked about. We call it the pro problem of geometric graph isomorphism in the context of studying these, this class of models. And then just to quickly recap before we dive into our work, um, graph isomorphism, right, is, is this problem that that I just made you do is the problem of telling whether two graphs are the same, but drawn differently. So whether two graphs are the same up to some relabeling of your nodes, uh, is their edge connectivity the same? Formally, 
does there exist an edge preserving bijective map going from the set of nodes of one graph to the other such that your scalar features remain the same and, and your edge connectivity uh, remains the same and there's an algorithm called the weisfeller lehmann test which which is uh, a test for te telling whether two graphs are isomorphic or not uh, and again to briefly recap the weisfeller lehmann test we'll describe our own version of this later but just to briefly recap this is a test which assigns some node colors to each node and then the key idea is that you injectively update these colors and that means that you 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 look at the colors of your neighborhood at each node and for each unique pattern you assign a unique new color in the next step um so so for example in these two in these for these two graphs you might start with all grays and then you could look at any node here and you'd see that there are two patterns here you know some nodes would have three gray neighbors and others would have two uh, and both would be gray themselves. So, so what you do is you produce a new color based on your own color at that step, as well as the set of your neighbors' colors using hash, which 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 is an injective map. So it's a perfect function which assigns to each unique input a unique output, uh, and the pro test essentially progresses iteratively. So you you keep updating these colors. Um, and if your colors converge as they do in this case, then your test has finished. And then you look at the histogram or the count of all the colors. In this case, the test converges because, you know, semantically it converges, maybe not absolutely in terms of colors, but semantically it, it converges. Um, so then you look at the histogram of colors upon convergence. And if the histogram is different, then the graphs are not isomorphic. But in this case, the histogram is the same and your test cannot tell them apart, um, which, which is a good, good way to say that this WL test is not perfect. As you can see, like it fails for certain uh, non-isomorphic graphs. It has failed to tell apart these two graphs, but um, there have been results showing that for most practical purposes, this is this is a very powerful test, and it may be sufficient for doing a lot of practical graph tasks. Uh, and WL is important for GNNs because, as you may have already seen, it's very aligned to message passing. You you do the same things, right? You you gather things locally and you propagate them. Uh, the key idea is that message passing based GNNs can be at most as powerful as WL in terms of being able to distinguish graphs. Uh, and and um, they would be as powerful if, uh, if the message passing can be made injective, which generally is hard, but WL essentially gives you an upper bound on, on what GNNs can do. So all the cases where WL will fail, GNNs will fail at as well. And that makes WL an excellent abstract tool for understanding really what are the theoretical limitations of GNNs. Because WL has been studied for several years and you know we understand it very well mathematically. So that gives us a really um, useful tool to understand where GNNs fail. And obviously when we know where things fail, we can also design better ones to overcome those limitations. So that's a quick primer on WL. Uh, the key research gap that we are addressing is that all these theoretical tools for normal GNNs, such as this WL framework, are actually inapplicable for geometric graphs, precisely due to those physical symmetries that we uh, that we talked about, precisely due to those uh, those rotational and translational symmetries that our architectures do need to respect. So that leads us to geometric graph isomorphism. So we could consider geometric graphs, and now we want to sort of be able to superimpose geometric graphs onto each other. Uh, we need to find, obviously, an attributed graph isomorphism, as the dashed edges show. But importantly, we need to make sure that the geometric attributes of our nodes are also equivalent when we up to some rotation and some translation. Uh, which is what the figure was showing, that you can somehow align these uh, geometric quantities as well. And so we need to define this notion of geometric graph isomorphism. And 
what that allows us to really do now is to define a geometric version of the WL test. Uh, and and our, our goal is to, to provide, again, a theoretical upper bound on the capabilities and expressivity of geometric graph neural networks. The, the key intuition here for generalizing WL to geometric graphs is that we need to retain the node-centric and injective procedure where you aggregate locally. So in standard WL and in GWL, you have a notion of neighborhoods. The only difference is that you now have these geometric quantities for your neighbors as well. Um, and again, you'd like to have a node coloring. So uh, WL, WL has this node coloring and you could think about the node coloring as a sort of um, fingerprint. So for unique neighborhoods, it assigns a unique color or unique fingerprint. So in GWL, we'd also like a coloring that um, identifies neighborhood type. Um, but importantly, right, in geometric graphs, we can have the same neighborhood type oriented differently in space, so rotated differently. And we need to account for this somehow. This is the extra piece of information in addition to neighborhood type that, that we now need to um, account for, which we didn't in WL because you know, neighborhoods didn't have orientation, neighborhoods didn't have physical vectorial meanings. And so that, that gives us the first property of this GWL test is that if two, two neighborhoods are the same up to rotation, their coloring must be the same, their fingerprint must be the same. Uh, and formally, this is orbit injectivity of colors. And this would also be invariant, of course, by definition, because rotated versions of the same neighborhood are in the same color. The second property is, um, is preserving local geometry. And the way to think about this really is that if you satisfy property one, if you assign the same color to rotated neighborhoods, you lose injectivity because you've lost information about how these two are oriented. Right? So you need to somehow retain the orientation, as we just said. Uh, and to do that, we, we make use of um, certain auxiliary geometric information variables. So we introduce a new variable in WL, which we call geometric information. And using this, we'll be able to retain injectivity while being equivariant, which means that we'll be able to um, retain how neighborhoods are oriented with respect to each other. And that allows us to start defining WL. Um, I'll go a bit briefly so that I can talk about maybe some of the experiments and theoretical results as well. So WL uh, or initializes every node with the color like WL does, as well as this information about the geometric subgraph around each node. And we'll show it through this gray blob. So at the start, you only have geometric information about yourself. But importantly, the key step is to aggregate local geometric information. So you need to grow this blob around your so that you can access geometry from further and further away at every iteration. Uh, and how you do this is uh, very akin to message passing, except that you're now nesting this geometric object. So uh, you update it by, you, by uh, just uh, collecting the geometry from your uh, neighbors. And the, the way to think about it essentially is that computational tree anal analogy, except that now you, you have a geometric computational tree. So you, you're able to look at your subgraph geometry around your central node, and each iteration is supposed to grow this subgraph uh, geometry. Uh, and as you grow this geometry, or along with growing this geometry, you also color your neighborhoods. Uh, much like WL, you, you, you need to summarize the information within your neighborhood or within your subgraph, um, except that you now use an invariant hash function, um, I hash, because this, this function will assign the same color to rotated versions of the same neighborhood. Uh, so if you were at this iteration and you uh, took one step of GWL, you would grow this uh, neighborhood, of course, but you'd also color all these nodes. Um, so for example, you'd color the central node one color, 
And then the nodes J and K are assigned the same color because their one hop subgraphs are the same up to rotations. Um, and the test, of course, progresses iteratively. So you, you, you know, update your uh, node colors as well as increase your subgraph view at, at every step. Um, and essentially in, in geometric GNNs, this, this coloring step actually corresponds to uh, what we're calling scalarization. Um, so in, in, in order to actually build a perfect IHash function, it's probably something very difficult. Like it's probably not a function that you can actually implement in neural networks, which is why these tests are on distances, angles, and very high uh, geometric invariant quantities in order to assign some unique descriptors to, to local neighborhoods. Uh, in, then, uh, finally, much like WL, we terminate when we reach a stable coloring. So in this example, I'll just show two graphs, uh, which are different, and we'll be coloring them using GWL. Uh, we already saw what happens for the first graph, but when you see what happens for the second graph, then you'll see how the test works. So at, at the first iteration, actually, the test assigns the same color to all the nodes in, in the two graphs. Uh, or corresponding nodes in the two graphs. And that's because all the one hop neighborhoods are actually the same up to rotations. So as we said, right, the I hash function assigns the same color up to rotations. Um, but, uh, but after the first iteration, you've now grown your geometric information, this blue blob to two hop neighborhoods. So we're showing it for the central uh, node I, and you can now see that the two hop neighborhoods are not superimposing onto each other, or you can't rotate them onto each other, right? So what that means is that in the second iteration, you'll actually be able to tell these two graphs apart because your central node uh, in the two graphs will be mapped to different colors. And when you compare the histogram of colors, your test will be able to tell these two graphs apart. And so we define GWL and really the purpose of defining this test uh, is to give a theoretical upper bound on geometric GNNs. So we, we show that equivariant geometric GNNs can be at most as powerful as GWL in terms of distinguishing non-isomorphic geometric graphs. Uh, we do this through just showing correspondence between message passing and you know, following proof techniques from uh, existing works. Uh, but this is important because it would allow us to now study geometric GNNs from, from this abstract perspective, which we'll show results of uh, very soon. The, the last tool that I want to introduce or a little extension on GWL that I want to introduce is an invariant version. So this version of the test is more restricted. Um, and this version of the test is really defined to study invariance versus equivariance. So the idea with IGWL is that you, of course, update your node colors using the IHash function as we did before. But importantly, you do not propagate geometric information. So you don't grow this subgraph geometry. You only look at geometric information locally. You don't, you never propagate geometry beyond one hop. And this, this means that, for example, these two graphs who are one hop identical. So all the one hop neighborhoods in these two graphs are the same. You'll actually never be able to tell them apart because at every step, you'll just keep coloring them the same as your, your I hash just looks locally. Um, and this is the key point, which, which we can then uh, show some results through. So so I'll, I'll skip some results, but the one of the important ones is the role of depth. So we've, we've defined all these tools. Let's look at what we can say about, about some of these uh, design choices that we'd spent some time discussing previously. So we, we, we can define this notion of K-hop distinct and identical geometric graphs. So in, in this case, you know, these graphs are one hop identical because all one hop neighborhoods can be superimposed onto each other. We already discussed this. Uh, but they're two hop distinct because the two hop neighborhoods cannot be superimposed. So this allows us to simply but um, 
in, in a precise way, characterize what GWL and geometric GNNs in the best case can distinguish. So we already saw this example and GWL can distinguish any K-hop distinct geometric graph uh, and K iterations are sufficient. Uh, on the other hand, and we saw this through examples as well, IGWL cannot distinguish any one hop identical geometric graphs. So if all your one hop neighborhoods are identical, then invariant message passing cannot distinguish them. And these two simple results actually allow us to precisely say that GWL is strictly more powerful as it can distinguish a broader range of graphs. And importantly, our framework allows us to say why or to understand the mechanism of why we should prefer equivariant message passing over invariant message passing. The reason is precisely this. So equivariant message passing propagates geometric information um, across this computational tree. Whereas with invariant message passing, right, from one layer to another or from one iteration to the other, you cannot propagate local geometry. So geometric information cannot flow in invariant GNNs. And this is what really restricts their expressive power. And essentially invariant GNNs will fail to understand how various one hop neighborhoods in a graph are oriented with respect to each other, how they're stitched together. And this really goes back to, you know, that those motivational slides that, that I was I was showing as well. Uh, we have more results where we are able to precisely say how invariant GNNs fail. Uh, I'll skip over them, but the key idea is that they fail to capture global geometry. And that actually gives us a recipe for improving them as well, because when you know what they fail to capture precisely, you can actually just uh, pre-compute those quantities and feed those as inputs, which, which several models do and um, has shown promising uh, empirical results as well. Now, uh, the last thing I want to uh, sort of quickly present before I conclude are some synthetic experiments. So we've released this code base called Geometric GNN Dojo, which has um, synthetic experiments designed to probe and test geometric GNN expressivity. These tests are really uh, thought of as unit tests, which are designed to tease out failure cases of existing models. Uh, and they're not real data, but are really interesting toy problems because the fact that we're not able to solve certain toy problems often means that there is some gap in our knowledge, which, which can materialize in more complex ways, right? So um, if you're new to Geometric GNNs, I do uh, encourage you to check out uh, Geometric GNN Dojo, which also has some uh, 101 tutorials on this field and, and uh, just is meant as a pedagogical resource for, for beginners and uh, experts. So one of the experiments I'll introduce very briefly is on depth. So we just talked about depth, right? And we said that GWL and equivariant GNNs are great because they propagate geometric information with each iteration. However, in practice, right, when you stack more layers, you, you often distort information. Um, I remember having really in interesting discussion with Ivor on this as well, that when you when you stack layers in GNNs, then you, you often distort long range information, right? Um, and we wanted to study how that manifests for geometric graphs. People have studied it for normal graphs. So we wanted to look at what happens for geometric graphs. Uh, so we create this uh, example, which we call K chains. And it's, it's just a generalization of what we were showing you. Um, essentially, we know how many iterations you need in theory to distinguish these two graphs. Uh, and what we do is we test uh, geometric GNNs with increasing number of layers to tell K chains apart. So um, firstly, what we see is that invariant GNNs are going to fail this task as expected, right? Like as we talked about, invariant message passing cannot actually tell how local neighborhoods are oriented. And when we look at the equivariant GNNs, we found something interesting. So this is a very simple task because we only look at four chains. So there are only four nodes here, but even on this very simple task, some of the most popular geometric GNNs like equivariant GNN and tensor field networks, they actually 
require more iterations than prescribed by theory to be able to um, solve this task. And in fact, when you when you go up to larger chains, right, like 10 or 20 or even more, then all these current models start to fail. It doesn't matter whether you increase the uh, embedding dimension very high or not, but these models start to fail. Uh, and we think that this is preliminary evidence of the over-squashing phenomenon for geometric information across multiple layers. And this is interesting because, you know, a, a lot of a lot of tasks often for biomolecules require long range interactions. And it's precisely the models that that are very popular for biomolecules that actually are not good at, at this uh, task of propagating geometric information. We also have an experiment on higher order tensors. So uh, again, the theory says that you can perfectly aggregate geometric information. Um, in practice, of course, you know, as we discussed, it's easier to work with Cartesian vectors, but the spherical bases and higher order tensors often give you um, give you um, potentially more powerful tools, but at a computational cost. So we wanted to investigate what happens or why do we actually need higher order tensors, which was an, again a question that the community uh, was interested in. Uh, and to do this, we define these symmetric structures. So these are symmetric structures which which wouldn't change if you rotated them. Uh, periodically. And we consider two distinct rotated versions of these structures. Um, and very, very briefly, um, what we saw was that, you know, um, when, whenever you encounter rotational symmetries, your, uh, your models which use low order tensors or vectors, uh, as we said, vectors are rank one tensors, uh, actually fail to, to tell apart how these uh, neighborhoods are oriented with respect to each other. And you essentially need to use the spherical framework and go up to very high tensor orders in order to um, identify the orientation of, of these um, structures, which are really designed to probe, uh, probe this idea. Uh, the reason why this works is related to spherical harmonics. Uh, but but the, the key thing is that the models that, again, are popular and are used by people actually have these uh, simple but interesting failure cases that, that we wanted to highlight. Um, I'll skip this third experiment. Uh, and just to conclude, um, I'll say that, again, you know, we, we discussed all these classes of models and we are now able to uh, put them into certain points on these axes, which, which help us understand their capabilities and their limitations. We designed the theoretical test, which, of course, you know, it is quite abstract, but the idea is that it gives us practical insights into why equivariant layers have an advantage over invariant layers. And uh, we also designed these synthetic experiments to, to really tell us what the need of higher order tensors, scalarization, and what are some of the practical challenges. So the full paper is on archive and it, it has more general results and more framework things. Um, it also has con connections to universal approximation theorem and universal universality guarantees of these models. We think that this uh, WL and discrimination-based perspective is actually more practical than studying universality because universality is often something quite binary. You know, a model is universal or not. Whereas here we can say precisely like, what can a model do and cannot do. Um, and I'll talk a bit about future work. Thank you uh, for attending. Thanks for the invitation and uh, very happy to receive any questions or discuss this uh, research direction. And thank you to uh, our collaborators as well.